Parked at Home uh, series. We are super excited to be bringing this series back again this year. Uh, we had a great series last year. You know, we met with six different parks over the course of six weeks. I had so many folks participate, so many folks tell us positive things about it, and we certainly uh, had a great time hosting the series, uh, so we knew that we wanted to bring the series back again this year, uh, bigger and better, if you will, this year we're doing seven weeks, um, so we are all uh, very excited to be bringing uh, the series back, you know, I always joke with folks that uh, maybe if you ever played a sport, or you were in a band, or or whatever have you, you know, there are those certain dates on the calendar that maybe you circled, you know, you made special note of them that you were building up or prepping for that day and really looking forward to that opportunity. Uh, and for us as interpretive park rangers, you know, this is the date that I had circled, you know, this time of year can be kind of rough for us. Uh, Slater Mill is closed. We're not doing a lot of public programming, not reaching out to the public. Uh, as, as much as we enjoy to do, you know, we're doing a lot of that behind the scenes work. I feel like all I've been doing for the past four weeks is interviewing folks for summer jobs and things like that. And all of that is important work. And that's why we spend so much time doing it. But we're all interpretive park rangers because we enjoy doing this type of stuff. So this was certainly a date that, you know, we all had circled on the calendar and um, we've been looking forward to. So hopefully uh, you all have been looking forward to this as well. Uh, and we'll continue this uh, journey together over the next seven weeks with each other. Just some lo logistics before we really jump into uh, tonight's conversation. This meeting is being recorded, so feel free to have your camera on or off, whatever you feel the most comfortable with. Uh, we're not going to hold your feet to the fire and tell you to have your camera on. Uh, whatever you are the most comfortable with, we want to encourage you to do that. So if you want to turn your camera off, that is totally fine. Um, in that vein that this meeting is being recorded, if you or your friends miss any of the future weeks, uh, we will post all of uh, these presentations to the Parks YouTube page. So if you know you're going to miss one week, you're really kind of bummed about that, no need to fear. Uh, or if you have a friend who you know would really enjoy one of the, uh, these talks, uh, just let them know that it'll be posted on the Parks YouTube page and you can access these programs there. We encourage folks throughout the course of our presentation to continue to type your questions and comments uh, into the chat. Uh, we've been asking folks to type their favorite National Park Service sites into the chat. We'll loop back to that in just a moment. Uh, but we wanna encourage you to continue to actively participate in our discussions by typing your questions and comments into the chat. We also ask folks to just please remain on mute for the duration of the program. That just cuts down on all that background noise and any interruptions that may happen. We'll have an opportunity at the end of tonight's program uh, for 10 or 15 minutes after we end our formal presentation for folks to hang around if you so choose uh, to unmute and have a more informal conversation at the end of tonight's program. If you have any technical issues uh, in tonight's program, uh, reach out to my colleague, Allison Horrocks. If you send her a direct message, she'll uh, help to walk you through any of those technical issues uh, that you may have. I also want to make special note that we are working in partnership, of course, with our partners at the Blackstone Heritage Corridor to host this program uh, on this platform. So as always, thank you to the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor for co-hosting uh, this series with us. And I also want to give special note to uh, a URI class. We are joined by Professor Stephanie West Puckett's class. Uh, who's doing a lot of digital work around the series, uh, trying to keep that uh, digital community alive and well. You know, the idea that our conversations don't have to be restricted to just an hour on each of these Thursday nights, but we can continue this conversation digitally throughout the rest of the week. So we encourage you to look up some of the work that they're doing by using the hashtag parked at home or, or looking them up at parked at home on Twitter or parked.at.com home.project on Instagram. So we encourage you to follow some of the work that they're doing uh, there. Okay, that's enough of the logistics stuff. Let's jump into our actual topic tonight. Uh, and so for those of you who may not be familiar with our park uh, and why we uh, do this program, Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park is a relatively new park. Uh, it was just legislated back in 2014. 
and our boundaries were just established back in 2021. And as you can see on your screen here, we have a lovely map of the Blackstone River Valley and the greenish outline uh, is the formal boundaries of the River Valley as a whole in the National Heritage Corridor. Uh, but our park is made up of six specific sites within that National Heritage Corridor that help to tell that story of the Blackstone River Valley as this birthplace and incubator of the Industrial Revolution and all the good, bad and ugly that came with that. Uh, we've been encouraging folks, you know, to type their favorite national park into the chat. We've had some really interesting answers, everything from Eisenhower National Historic Site to Yellowstone, of course, uh, to Ellis Island, to Arches. I'm also a huge fan of Arches. Um, Acadia, uh, and a, a few of you who get bonus points for saying our national park, Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. Uh, and, you know, I think the really neat thing about the National Park Service is that many of us have very specific and real intimate connections with these places. And I'm sure that there is a reason why each of you decided to pick that specific park as your favorite park. For me, uh, Gettysburg National Military Park is my favorite park visited there as a very young child at a very early age with my family, a place that I've been back to again and again. And it has a special meaning to me because of those personal connections that I have with it. And I think many of us as Americans have these very special connections with the National Park Service. And by and large, whether Republican or Democrat, however you think politically, economically, socially, most Americans can kind of unite around that concept of the National Park Service and the special place that these parks hold in our hearts. You know, it's always fun to sit at the front desk, whether it's an old Slater Mill or at Roger Williams National Memorial, and you're sitting there and a family comes in and they got their big passport book and they are looking to get their passport book stamped to say that they have visited that park. Uh, we call those people stampers. They come in, they know exactly what they're looking for. Um, my wife is one of these people, so I do not speak derogatory of these people because my wife is one of them uh, who's got to get her stamp. Uh, but I think it's an illustration of how many people connect with the National Park Service uh, and, and really find value in all of these places. There is a very famous quote uh, that's not as old as I think many people think it is, uh, but that was stated in 1983 by Wallace Stegner. And Wallace Stegner said, quote, the national parks are the best idea we ever had. Absolutely American, absolutely democratic. They reflect us at our best rather than our worst, end quote. Uh, Ken Burns, I think, really capitalized on this quote when he made a documentary, as Ken Burns does with a lot of things, uh, baseball, the Civil War, um, on the National Park Service. And he named that documentary series, The National Parks, America's Best Idea. It's a common ground for many of us, the national parks. Many of the stories that are told in these places are widely varied. Stories of people sacrificing their lives for this nation. Places like Antietam National, Mil uh, National Battlefield in Maryland, a battle during the American Civil War, or maybe Flight 93 National Memorial in Pennsylvania, where individuals uh, stopped the hijacking of a plane on 9-11 uh, and prevented that plane from flying into potentially the Pentagon that day. Places like, uh, that speak about the industrialization of the United States, places like Slater Mill, which we protect and preserve as Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park, or Lowell National Historical Park. Other places that uh, preserve the sites where we as humans soared to new limits uh, in, techno in technology and advancements to new heights, literally with Wright Brothers. We met with them last year during our Parked at Home series. Uh, in places like Edison. Um, other places talk about the struggle for equality, places like Brown versus the Board of Education and Manzanar Concentration Camp. Other National Park Service sites preserve the natural beauty of our nation, places like Acadia and Arches, which are both listed as uh, some people's favorite national parks. But when we boil it down, there is one national park <laughs> 
which stands out above the rest. And that is, of course, the first national park uh, to be declared in the United States and in the world, Yellowstone National Park. Now, some of us may have visited Yellowstone. Others may have not. I've never personally been to Yellowstone. But I wanted to start off our discussion of Yellowstone tonight uh, by giving us all an opportunity to have a shared experience with that park and its resources. So if you'll indulge me for a few seconds here, I'd like to share uh, with all of you um, a, a video uh, that talks a little bit about that shared experience and what people uh, may experience when they visit uh, Yellowstone National Park. So we will pull up this video here. Make sure I do that. That and that. And so uh, here we go. One of the most famous uh, National Park Service Rangers, I think, is Ranger Shelton. I believe he's at Yosemite now. Uh, and this is a small clip that was shown as part of uh, Ken Burns's National Park series. And Ranger Shelton's going to talk a little bit about his experience one day uh, at Yellowstone National Park. One of the last jobs I had in Yellowstone was delivering the mail on snowmobile. There I was in the world's first national park. And I remember going down into Hayden Valley. There were bison crossing over the road, 2,000 pound mammals crossing over the road. And it was so cold, it was about 60 below zero. And the bison, as they breathe, their exhalation would seem to crystallize in the air around them. And there were these sheets, these ropey strands of crystals kind of flowing down from their breath. And uh, uh, I saw them, they just moved their heads and were looking at me. And I remember thinking that if I had not been on that machine, I would have thought I had been thrust fully back into the Pleistocene, back into the Ice Age. And I remember just stopping and turning it off because the only way you could hear is to turn that thing off. And I would turn it off and I would listen. And I felt like this was the first day. And this morning was the first time the sun had ever come up. And the shadows that are being cast right now is the first time those shadows have ever been cast on the earth. And I was all alone, but I felt I was in the presence of everything around me and I was never alone. It was one of those moments when you get pulled outside of yourself into the environment around you. And I felt like I was just with the breath of the bison as they were exhaling and as I was exhaling and they were inhaling, it was all kind of flowing together. And I forgot completely about the male. All I was thinking of was that a single moment in a place as wild as Yellowstone, or most of the national parks, can last forever. So now we've all had uh, an experience, if you will. I think Ranger Shelton does a great job of kind of putting us in that time and that place with him in this really powerful moment that he had in Yellowstone National Park. And I want to make the argument tonight that, you know, Yellowstone and this theme of preservation of Yellowstone fits quite nicely into our broader Parked at Home series themes. The idea behind this series is to bring National Park Service staff and experts from across the nation to talk about our common stories, our shared experiences, and encourage folks to visit these places and to learn more about them. But you don't necessarily have to visit these places to engage in these discussions. And so tonight, I want to invite all of you to engage in this discussion with us about Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and to do that, we are very honored this evening to be joined uh, by uh, Dr. Megan Kate Nelson. Dr. Megan Kate Nelson is a writer and historian who specializes in the American Civil War, the U.S. West, and popular culture. She is the author of The Three-Cornered War, The Union, The Confederacy, and Native Peoples, and The Fight for the West, which was the finalist for the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in History. She has also written articles for the New York Times, Washington Post, 
Time, The Atlantic, Slate, and Smithsonian Magazine. Before leaving academia to write full-time in 2014, she taught U.S. History and American Studies at Texas Tech University, Cal State Fullerton, Harvard University, and Brown University. Dr. Nelson earned her bachelor's degree in history and literature from Harvard University and her PhD in American Studies from University of Iowa. And her most recent book, which just came out last year, almost a year to the day, in fact, March 3rd, I believe, is when this book came out, um, Saving Yellowstone, Exploration and Preservation in Reconstruction America, the genesis of this talk, if you will. Uh, Allison and I read this book early last year uh, and were struck by uh, not just how well written it is, but really the powerful story that it tells. And so we knew that we had to have uh, Dr. Megan Kate Nelson as part of our series this year. So we are both honored and privileged to have her with us here this evening. Uh, and to get our conversation started, um, Megan, could you just tell us a little bit about Yellowstone as a whole? Uh, what is the park and why did you decide to write uh, this excellent book uh, about Yellowstone? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. That was a, a wonderful introduction. I love that that quote from the video about getting pulled outside of yourself and into the landscape. That's so true. Uh, when you go to so many of our, our nation's national parks, especially nature parks, although I think you can experience that too at, at a number of different sites, right? I mean, I'm sure you experienced that at Gettysburg also. Um, <clears throat> so hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And thanks, of course, to Mark and Allison for inviting me to be here tonight. I am in Lincoln, Massachusetts, uh, home of Minuteman National Historical Park. Uh, which is my second favorite national park. And in fact, I, you know, am in it much more often than I'm in Yellowstone. So I should say that is my most probably well-traveled national park. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen with you. I just have a couple of slides uh, here for you. Um, uh, I started thinking about Yellowstone National Park probably in <clears throat> Around 2018, I was thinking about a new book project after I was in the middle of finishing um, The Three-Cornered War, my previous book, and there was a surveyor in that book named John Clark. He was the Surveyor General of New Mexico Territory. So I had done, I was doing a lot of research into the history of surveying, and I ran across, again, Ferdinand Hayden, who was the geologist and explorer uh, who and surveyor who uh, launched this initial scientific expedition into Yellowstone in 1871. And I had actually run into him before in an art history class uh, in graduate school. And uh, those of you who know a little bit about this expedition know why, um, because you know this is the expedition that produced the amazing photographs um, of William Henry Jackson and then several major paintings by Thomas Moran, one of which is on the cover of the book. So I started thinking about Yellowstone and then I realized wait a minute, it's the 150th anniversary of, this, of the expeditions coming up, also the 150th uh, anniversary of the passage of the Yellowstone Act on March 1st, 1872. Uh, so this was coming up in 2022. And, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about writing popular history books, anniversaries are really great times to really think about. And, and, and those of you who work at parks probably experience this also. When you have an anniversary, it's sort of this moment that you can mark, right? And you think about the passage of time and how things have changed. And so that was my first thought. And then my second thought was, well, a lot of books have been written about Yellowstone. <laughs> like, how am I going to write something that is remotely new? Um, because it does have to be new. Um, it doesn't just have to be kind of engaging and fun to read. And so uh, I kind of was looking through all the books that had been written, and most of them were, you know, in the context of the history of conservation. And I thought, wait a minute, this is 1871-72. This is right in the middle of Reconstruction that the U.S. Congress is taking this unprecedented action um, to take lands out of, uh, you know, from territories and to give them to the Department of the Interior to manage. I mean, there were precedents before that of saving lands for the benefit of the people, but no one had ever done this before, kind of given it to the federal government. Um, so why were they doing that? In the middle of Reconstruction, in the wake of a, a really destructive civil war, 
why that that seemed really strange and bizarre to me but also really interesting as a driving question for a book um so for those of you um and and I should say I'll, I'll show you a picture here in a second of my first time going to Yellowstone um but for those of you who have been those of you who have not uh you know one a, a kind of refresher and one a, an introduction. Um, Yellowstone National Park is our, our first uh, federally designated national park. Uh, when it was saved, it was about 1.1 million acres and now it has grown in size. It's about doubled in size and it is three times the size of Rhode Island. So massive, massive uh, space with 4 million visitors a year around. Um, it's been kind of pinging around between about 3.8 and, and 4 million for the past couple of years with a big spike um, during COVID, interestingly. Um, at first a dip and then a spike. Um, and that's all within a pretty truncated visitation window, right? Because uh, it starts snowing in Yellowstone uh, in early September, and it does not stop snowing until <laughs> early May. And so um, you can really cannot get that. Most sections of the park are shut down. There's a kind of section, a slice through the north that is open. Um, but for the most part, those 4 million visitors uh, come into the park and out of the park in the span in four months. Um, so that's a lot. A million visitors a month is a lot. Um, and Yellowstone is one of those places, you know, it ends up on the number one on people's bucket lists in a lot of different surveys, you know, and travel magazines and things. And, and I think one of the reasons that it's so popular and kind of is known as one of the nation's iconic nature parks is that it just, it hits on all cylinders, right? It's got everything. It has Yellowstone Lake, which is um, the highest freshwater lake uh, in the United States. It's got um, a lot of other lakes and waterfalls and canyons and valleys, and most of those um, are on the eastern side of the park. And then it's got this massive, uh, in, kind of somewhat interconnected um, system of geyser basins, um, more than 10,000 geothermal features. I mean, just incredible, right? Um, and there are geysers and hot springs and mud pots. The mud pots are my personal favorite. Uh, if you'd like to enter into the chat what your favorite part of Yellowstone is, please do that if you have been there. Um, I'd love to know. Um, and, then it, and then it has animals. It has charismatic megafauna, right? It has bison. It has wolves and elk and moose and bears in addition to a, a lot of other uh, animal life, bird life. Um, but those five are sort of the big five, right? And everyone wants a glimpse at those and maybe also some, some mountain sheep. Um, so these are some photographs that I took in my most recent trip uh, to Yellowstone. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a little bit uh, foggy because it was actually a trip um, in May, so it was pretty early in the the visitation window, and was still snowing. At, we I've been snowed on several times um, at different points of the year in in Yellowstone, um, but it has these iconic features: the falls and Old Faithful, which you can see here on the left, and then of course uh, the bison. Uh, my husband actually saw uh, one of the white wolves in the the Hayden Valley while I was driving, and I didn't get to see it, and I've never been so mad in my life. So. Um, you know, they, there are all of these experiences that you can have in Yellowstone, and it makes it a really, really special experience, I think. Um, so that was my most recent trip. This was my first trip. Uh, so this was 1982. I was 10 years old. Uh, this is me with my annoying older brother. Uh, clearly, you know, for those of you who are Gen Xers like me, if you grew up in the West, you recognize this particular fashion statement that we are making, the powder jacket, uh, which was a ski jacket. Uh, clearly all the rage, because look at us. Um, amazing. Um, but this is another one of the reasons Yellowstone is special to me, because this was the first of our family vacations um, in the car. And, you know, while they were happening, it was two weeks every July uh, for much of my, from basically age 10 to age 16 or 17. And, you know, while they were happening, I complained constantly, right? Um, and I was like, why? And my brother too, we were like, why can't we just go to Disneyland? Why can't we just get in the plane and go to Disneyland uh, like normal people? Why do we have to drive around in this car to all of these different places? <laughs> Um, but when I look back on it now, I realize that this is the beginning of many formative moments. Um, I grew up in Colorado, 
this Yellowstone was our first, we went to Jackson Lake first. So we kind of actually Grand Teton was kind of the first um, park we entered on this trip and then Yellowstone. Um, but we drove, you know, thousands of miles all around um, through the course of these vacations and went to national parks, went to historic sites. My father was a huge fan of history. So we used to joke that, that he needed a bumper sticker that said like, I will break for, for historical monuments or there was any sign along the side of the road that says of historical interest, we would just veer off the side of the road, right? Um, so I come by my, my interest in that naturally, but um, I think that was the beginning of the moment where I started to connect history with the landscape and moving through the landscape. Because, you know, this is a time um, for the students who are here, you're probably gonna be like, oh my God, this is like, again, the Pleistocene. Um, that we were in cars with no devices. There was nothing to look at except a book, your toys, your family members are out the window, right? Um, or the map and the coveted place uh, in the car during these trips was shotgun because um, you got control of the map and you got to tell either my mother or my father what to do, right? You got to tell them where to go, where to turn. And I was following the map and I've been obsessed with maps kind of ever since. I love maps and mapping as part of my project. So, so Yellowstone is really not only a formative kind of moment in my family's history. And I think, um, you know, for those of you who work at parks, you see this all the time, families on vacation, I imagine, in various states <laughs> of joy and disarray. Um, but uh, it's part of my family history, but also I think a really vital moment in my progression as someone who then became a historian of American landscapes. Um, and increasingly lately, I have been really interested uh, in indigenous histories on the land. And I think that it is, it's an inescapable fact that, you know, uh, the creation of natural park, national parks um, has rested uh, historically and also in contemporary times on indigenous uh, land dispossession. And this is one of the stories that I tell in Saving Yellowstone uh, is this conflict um, between uh, the federal government and multiple tribal nations, though, especially the Lakota in this context. Um, Yellowstone has historical ties to 27 tribal nations. And this is fascinating to me. Only, only um, half of them are, are depicted here on this map. There are other smaller bands that have a, have a relationship also. Um, but through this, you can see how Yellowstone was sort of the center of an indigenous trading network and a hunting network. Uh, they were using Yellowstone to, in many ways, as a thoroughfare to get to the bison hunting grounds of southern Wyoming and Nebraska. Um, they Indigenous peoples also used it as a ceremonial site, a hunting site, particularly in winter when all the animals convened on Yellowstone because it was so much warmer than its surrounding areas. Um, and you know, this became an, a really important site of, of religious and medicinal ceremonies as well. So this is a place that mattered um, to indigenous peoples before it mattered uh, to the federal government, to Ferdinand Hayden uh, and any tourists, you know, and certainly long before uh, my family entered Yellowstone in 1982. Um, so this is one of the things, um, <clears throat> and in the 150th anniversary year, actually Yellowstone began a number of initiatives to start to recognize and integrate indigenous histories into the park. Um, which has been great. There have been uh, material culture kind of um, events and installations. And then they also have set up uh, an indigenous history kind of um, building right at um, Old Faithful, which is really great placement because that is the most popular site in Yellowstone, right? So people then are going to be able to interact uh, with indigenous peoples from multiple tribal nations who can then tell the stories of their people's um, interactions with the park, their, their use of the park and their um, sense of ownership of the park itself. Um, so in the book, uh, I tell the story of the exploration and preservation of Yellowstone through three different people. Hayden, I have uh, introduced before. He was from Massachusetts originally, uh, really ambitious, 
very smart and quick, uh, found his way to Oberlin, where he discovered the science of geology. He figured out that he had this really interesting kind of weird talent for collecting fossils. He was able to, to spot them in the earth and, and pick them up and dig them out and collect them and, um, and understand their significance just by looking at them. And so this started his scientific career, but soon he really uh, discovered that he wasn't going to make a lot of money selling fossils to scientists. And so he decided he had gone out on a lot of surveys uh, as a scientist and decided that he wanted to lead them himself. And so by 1871, he had already led several surveys uh, for the state of Nebraska and then for the federal government. And it was, he was kind of a, um, like an independent contractor every year in the spring uh, session that ended in March, he had to lobby politicians to give him money. Then he had to bring his team together. Then he had to get where he was going, do his survey, get back by the fall, produce a multi, you know, a very large uh, report, like hundreds of pages reports on all of his findings, submit that to Congress, and then start the whole lobbying process again, right? So this was this was the job. This was in the days before uh, the USGS. Uh, so this is how the scientific knowledge of these regions was created. So he launched uh, this survey. In 1871, Congress gave him $40,000 uh, in 1871, which is about a million dollars in today's money, uh, to go and survey Yellowstone, which at this point was one of the last unmapped places in the United States. Um, so he collected a survey team. He set out in May. Uh, and came back in October, uh, had a lot of, you know, fears about what was going to happen to the survey. Would they be uh, attacked by indigenous peoples who lived on the edges of the park? Uh, would they, uh, you know, succumb to injury or illness? And in the end, like during the survey itself, it was actually quite successful. Um, and they were able to send 45 boxes of specimens back to the Smithsonian uh, and start writing this report. Um, now I should note, Hayden did not go to Yellowstone with the thought of preserving it as a national park. He was there to figure out what was there, to see if the federal government could develop any part of Yellowstone in a productive manner, uh, and to produce the report and really kind of understand Yellowstone geologically. So he had a couple of different goals, but they were not preservation. The person who suggested that maybe he might wanna lobby Congress to create Yellowstone as a national park was actually A.B. Nettleton, the PR man for Jay Cook, who is the second protagonist of the book and the financier of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, so this was a fascinating part of this whole story that I had not known before I started the research on this. The Northern Pacific was supposed to be the second transcontinental. Uh, it was supposed to be finished in 1876 um, as the Centennial Line uh, to connect the Great Lakes uh, and the Pacific. And the line was going to run just 50 miles north of Yellowstone in what is now through what is now Livingston, Montana. Um, and so Jay Cook was really interested in Hayden's findings. Um, he sent him Thomas Moran uh, it, so that Thomas Moran could take a lot of sketches and, and Cook planned to use those to advertise the Northern Pacific. And he, you know, really wanted to know what was, uh, what was happening so he could bring tourists to Yellowstone possibly. Now, neither he nor Hayden uh, really understood that there was a, a figure more powerful than them in the region who was kind of gonna stand in the way of their goals. And that was uh, Tatanka Iatake or Sitting Bull, uh, the, the chief of the Hunkpapa Lakota, um, who during this period really began um, to assert himself as the leader of the Hunkpapa uh, and a larger group of, of the Hunkpapa and their allies, their Lakota and their Cheyenne and Arapaho allies, and to protest against the laying of track across their lands and to defend their territory, which extended from the Missouri River all the way up the Yellowstone um, to the basin, right? So they claimed that whole area and they were not about to let uh, either scientific surveyors or Northern Pacific Railroad surveyors um, to come into their land and lay any track and take it away from them. So it's really uh, the, the conflict and then also sometimes the cooperation between uh, these three men that drives the, the narrative in the book. Um, and 
I will kind of stop there so that we can uh, discuss a bit more um, this really fascinating and interesting history. And now I need to stop sharing, but I am, I've got a notification in the way. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> got it together. Not like I've been doing, haven't been doing this for like three years now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. That was great uh, for certainly setting the stage for uh, how all of this comes together in these three pivotal figures. Um, you made mention earlier though, and it's right in the title of your book that this is a product of reconstruction America. And so for those of us who maybe haven't been in a history class for a little while, maybe we're a little fuzzy on what reconstruction <laughs> was, what was reconstruction and how did this reconstruction era provide the right formula for the idea of a national park? Yeah, so that is a great question. That is obviously a major part of the book, which I did not preview. But um, yes, yeah, so in the wake of the Civil War, you know, Republicans had control of Congress um, and the whole process by which the former Confederate states were re-entering uh, the United States, which they didn't actually do fully until 1870. So kind of right before this process gets started. Um, but during this period, really during the Civil War, also the federal government starts to grow in its power, right? Because it takes a lot of coordination and a lot of money and a lot of centralized power to fight a war. Um, and then in Reconstruction, it started growing again. And, and usually historians, when they refer to Reconstruction, are talking pretty specifically about a number of plans that Republicans put in place to bring those Confederate states back into the Union. Um, and you know, military occupation and then requirements about ratifying the 13th and the 14th and ultimately the 15th amendments, um, you know, eradicating slavery, providing for citizenship and then providing black men with the vote. Um, and so I think we're used to thinking about reconstruction as solely a Southern experience. But what I found was really interesting, and again, this was one of my questions, why, why would Congress give Hayden $40,000 in the middle of Reconstruction? Why would they be interested in exploring the West during this period when they're most interested in bringing the South kind of back into the Union? And I think it was for a couple of reasons. One, the federal government was sort of exploring its reach and power in multiple regions, right? Definitely the South, but also the West. Um, and it was exerting its power through the military in both places. Um, the, the kind of enemy was different. Um, the, the federal government and Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, who was the president during this period, were going after the KKK in the South um, and actually putting them on trial. I was writing the sections on um, the, the trials of the KKK as the January 6th insurrection was happening. And that was super interesting because uh, ultimately the federal government prosecuted Klan members on charges of conspiracy, which is exactly what the insurrectionists have uh, been tried on and convicted of, right? Um, so that's an interesting kind of parallel moment. In the West, though, the U.S. government is going after Native people because they, you know, the while the white supremacists in, in the South are standing in the way of Black citizenship, Native peoples in the West are standing in the way of white settlement um, and the taking up of lands, right? So the federal government is sort of using the same kinds of tools to achieve, achieve a similar object, right? They, they want Yellowstone and they want land, you know, for the benefit of the people by which they meant uh, usually white people. Um, but they also wanted to protect uh, equal rights and Black freedom, because that's what the war was fought for, right? And Grant felt really, really strongly about that also, because he was great friends with Lincoln. Obviously, he had been a general during the war, and there had been a you know huge loss of life. And so he really felt like if he did not defend Black rights, it was kind of going against everything that the U.S. had achieved in the war. But so th this is an interesting moment, and I think people started, the, the Wallace Stegner quote is so interesting because it, it was true in the moment. People were talking about Yellowstone as a distinctively American project, as a democratic project that was going to bring Northerners and Southerners together. 
in the West. That was the other kind of larger goal um, to give Americans a place where, and, and some people actually used this term, you know, we think of it as recreation, but they were thinking of it as recreation, right? Um, and, and they often used that wordplay, which was really, really fascinating. So I think this is, I mean, Yellowstone is a reconstruction project, and I don't think that we've really thought about it in that way at all before. I, I find that fascinating that the word recreation is used. Because in so many ways, now when we talk about the National Park Service, we don't want necessarily to recreate a landscape. We want to preserve a landscape or keep it in its preserved state. So that idea of recreation is fascinating. Um, I guess one of the big questions that that provokes for me, though, this idea of all of this is coming out of reconstruction, right, in this era where the federal government is exerting this immense power um, and kind of posturing to preserve and protect the civil rights of newly freed African Americans and uh, all across the South, but at the same time using that power to dispossess Native peoples from their land. And here in the Blackstone Valley, for example, right around the same time in the 1880s, the state of Rhode Island uh, makes the decision to detribalize the Narragansett people as uh, as a tribe. So in this era, we how do we? I guess my question for you is how do we reconcile these two things? How do we reconcile this fight for civil rights on the one hand, for formerly enslaved peoples, with the dispossession of land of other people? It's so hard, isn't it? I mean, it's really hard to think that the same party and the same people are doing these things which seem to us to be completely contradictory, right? On the one hand, kind of reaching for this higher ideal. I mean, the federal government would not protect Black rights with the fervor and attention that they did in 1871 and 72 for really another 80 years, basically, for almost a century. I mean, just kind of astounding, right? Um, and then here they are creating this national park, you know, without precedent, um, pulling lands out of development, which was unheard of, right? Goes against everything, goes against the American dream, goes against manifest destiny, kind of undermines all of that. So again, another like really high ideal. And yet, uh, especially the national park creation rests on this really kind of dark, um, action, right? And um, something that is not what we would think of as, as a higher ideal, right? And, and um, kind of besmirches it a little bit. And it's hard for us to, to reconcile those two things, I think, because we, I think often we think that people need to be super consistent all the time. Like you have to believe uh, along a certain, you know, a certain set of things that, and they all have to align. Uh, and that was definitely not the case, you know, and, and 19th century Americans <clears throat> embraced contradiction. They were perfectly capable of advocating for black rights and Indian extermination at the same time. Um, and seeing that as part of a larger, both of those things as part of an, a larger national project that kind of fulfilled the the promise of the United States, right? Um, that both of those things would. It was about equality and expansion, right? And they did not see uh, indigenous peoples as citizens. I mean, it says in the Fourteenth Amendment, um, there is a um, you know the Fourteenth Amendment provides citizenship to everyone born or naturalized in the United States, and then there is a parenthetical, except. Indians untaxed, which means native people is not living on reservations at the time, which was the Lakota people, mo the vast majority of the Lakota people at this time, and certainly uh, Sitting Bull. So, you know, they didn't see them as citizens with any rights. Uh, and, and that is something I think that, you know, we really want to embrace this idea of national parks as our best idea. And in many ways it is, but then it's got this very complicated uh, history 
uh, and a very dark history that I think we do need to acknowledge. I mean, we need to reconcile it, right? We need to acknowledge it um, and we need to, to understand the origins, I think really in order to appreciate the park itself, right? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and in your book, I don't want to belabor this point, but you spend a chapter talking about uh, Ulysses S. Grant and his former uh, aide-de-camp, uh, Eli Parker, who was a man who was a Native American descent, um, who served with Grant during the Civil War, uh, and Grant placing Eli Partner, Parker as the head of uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and kind of their thought process behind what was happening in the West. So could you just kind of tell us a little bit more about that and kind of how that fits into this story as well, this idea of civilization of Native American tribes? Yeah, this is, you know, Grant, I hadn't really known a lot about him before I started researching this book. And now I think he's one of the, the underrated presidents. Uh, there were lots of problems with his presidency, but he also did some really interesting things, uh, especially in his first term. Uh, and one of them was the appointment of Ely Parker, um, who was the highest ranking indigenous person in the federal government. Again, like after him, for a hundred years, right? Um, and so, you know, he he brought him in over the objections of many of his cabinet members, and um, and he and Parker had some interesting ideas. I mean, Parker was definitely an assimilationist. Uh, he was Seneca. He um, was descended from from very prominent leaders uh, in his tribal nation. Um, he was educated in schools and learned English, was very skilled, was much smarter and more skilled than Grant himself. And, um, and he really believed that the future of Native people was going to be citizenship and quote unquote civilization, um, which to him really meant abandonment of indigenous identity and tradition and embrace of Americanization and clothing and religion and language. Um, and all of these things lead to then later the development of, of boarding schools, which have become, you know, we have we have started to learn more and more about the horrible things that happen in those contexts to, to native children. Um, and I think, you know, it's horrible to learn, but we need to learn it, right? We need to acknowledge that as well. Um, but they also had an interesting idea, like Ely Parker was talking to Grant about, and Grant actually seemed really open to this idea that yes, Native people needed to go to reservations, but Parker thought that what should happen is that all Native people should be concentrated into two giant territories and that those territories should then become states and have representation in Congress. Um, and no one had had thought about that before, right? No one had, no one had even considered that before. And imagine like what our political history would look like or what our political map would look like with four senators um, from indigenous nations. I mean, that would be kind of amazing. Um, and that, of course, did not come to pass. Ely Parker ended up getting shoved out of, of Grant's administration, um, kind of hounded out um, unfairly. Uh, but it was this appointment was, I think, one of Grant's most surprising actions uh, as as president and really showed that he was like Lincoln, kind of capable of evolving in his thought about um, native land rights. But then without Parker's influence, he kind of settled back into his U.S. Army kind of default mode, which was no more treaty making. We're just going to make war upon native peoples and force them to surrender and force them onto reservations point it strikes me right that in reconstruction era an individual of indigenous descent would be appointed to such a position our current mm -hmm. secretary of the interior deb holland as well as our current director of the park service chuck sams are the first individuals of indiv of indigenous descent to hold those roles um mm -hmm. and we're in 2023 so mm -hmm. we're talking 150 years almost ahead of uh, the curb there uh, in many ways. You also talk a lot in the book, though, about to kind of segue into another topic, Yellowstone being inaccessible for a large uh, amount of 
white Americans not being able to get into the region in order to explore the region and how the railroad really provides that opportunity, whether that's the transcontinental railroad or this eventually Northern Pacific railroad that another figure that you've mentioned, Jay Cook is really behind. So could you tell us a little bit more about that process of and the importance of the railroad in getting folks to uh, the Yellowstone Valley. Sure, yeah, this is, um, I, I think my interest in this probably goes back to, again, my my interest in being on the road, right? Like how do people get um, from place to place, especially in the West, where there are such huge distances between places. And I think we can all agree, I mean, you don't just drop by Yellowstone, right? If you don't live in the area, you're not just going to run into it by accident, right? <laughs> like you really have to mean to go there. Um, and so, um, you know, in the in the 1870s, it really was. If you were coming from the east, it, you were never going to make it uh, in time to explore uh, that area because that window, that visitation window, was just not going to be open to you. You weren't going to be able to make it. And so, the Union Pacific Railroad, which was enabled by an act of actually Civil War legislation in 1862, um, as the Transcontinental was really vital to Hayden. Um, he took trains all the way out um, to the Missouri River and then crossed on a ferry and then picked up the Union Pacific in Omaha. And he and his team um, made, made a stop um, in Cheyenne, Wyoming to resupply and then went all the way to Ogden. And it cut, uh, it, I mean, it just cut his travel time by a tremendous amount. And he was then able to start his trip north from Ogden, Utah um, toward the Yellowstone in you know early June, uh, and that was tremendous for him because actually Hayden had tried to go. There was a military reconnaissance that tried to get into Yellowstone um, in 1860, but they didn't make it because they ended up trying to come in through the south uh, and ran into the Tetons and were not able. It snowed them out before they could even get in there. So the the Railroad is hugely important for him. Um, you know, it was a federal project. He was able to get, uh, re, you know, kind of dedu deductions on passes for his men to save money um, because it was a federal project. Um, he also sent all of those boxes back to the Smithsonian on the train. Uh, so they arrived relatively quickly and many of those specimens were saved uh, because of the quickness of that travel. Um, so, you know, that that is a, a big component is sort of how we enter national park spaces, how we move through them is a, is a really interesting history. And I think we also saw with the June floods in Yellowstone that took out the road from Gardner to Mammoth Hot Springs and therefore kind of shut down um, that northern part of the park. Also the road through the Lamar Valley was partially destroyed. And when that happens, you know, what do you do? I mean, Yellowstone went into major crisis mode because, and they ended up, they, they haven't fixed that road yet, but they had to build a new road. And luckily they could, like there was actually a, a dirt path there that they have now paved. Um, and apparently is quite harrowing in parts because it's very steep pitch, um, but that has allowed them access. But, you know, we see how um, important kind of gateway communities are and also entrances and, um, you know, how how do we actually access these places? Um, and I just saw in the chat, um, Patricia uh, made this note about the closest that getting to Yellowstone was um, providing provisions for MPS firefighters who were going out for the 88 fires. And my uncle, who uh, was a volunteer firefighter in um, the Rockies in, in Colorado, was also deployed to go fight those fires in, in 1988. Um, so um, yes, Yellowstone, still on your bucket list. But yeah, I mean, you really, you have to plan, right? And now, of course, I mean, and again, the park is so huge. And the gateway communities, I mean, there are four of them, which is fantastic, but they're small, right? So you have to plan more than a year in advance now if you want to go to Yellowstone um, because you can't camp there. You can't get a, a hotel or a motel either inside the park or in any of the gateway communities um, if you wait. 
<laughs> and if you procrastinate. Um, and so that kind of element of travel and transportation and, and how is that infrastructure going to help you get to the park? I mean, this has been part of Yellowstone's history since the beginning. I mean, Cook wanted to bring tourists. He ultimately did not because Sitting Bull, spoiler alert, prevented him um, from building that track and the Northern Pacific failed initially and didn't actually get to Yellowstone until 10 years later um, in 1883. So, um, you know, the, but this this is important. I mean, how how do you actually get to these places? Um, and, and what is the history of that infrastructure in all of our national park sites? I think that's an important history to note. Definitely. Uh, infrastructure is the reason why folks can visit the parks. And this is striking for me because one of the biggest conversations, I think, in the Park Service today, one of the, the huge challenges in the next hundred years, um, I think one report said, was uh, in our mission statement as the National Park Service, we are called to preserve unimpaired for future generations these places and to provide for the recreation and enjoyment of the American people. And those two things, although they may seem similar, right, can be inverses of each other. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the more people that are allowed to enjoy and recreate in these places, the more potential damage that can cause to the resource. And there's this really cool quote from the book that I just want to read a small segment of where uh, you are writing uh, in the mind of Hayden. And you write, could science continue to study the White Mountain if it were thronged with tourists and health seekers? Would private ownership turn one of the West's grandest sites imaginable into an eyesore, like the commercial hotels that crowded around Niagara Falls in New York? Could this place continue to exist if it were full of people? And mm -hmm. I think in many ways, this fear that you're alluding to here, right, is a very real reality sometimes when you visit a national park and get to the edge of the Grand Canyon and are crowded there with hundreds of other people who want to see that same view. Mm -hmm. And so as we look forward as the National Park Service, how do we balance those? Um, and I think that that is a story that very much plays into this infrastructure story and accessibility, yeah. right? We want these places to be accessible because the only way to create good stewards for the next generation is for these places to be accessible. But at the same time, when you take a tour group through Slater Mill, a hundred kids rubbing their hand against a 200 plus year old uh, wooden beam does irreparable damage to that 200 plus year old wooden beam. So how do we reconcile these things? Um, my, oh my, did this hour fly by or did this hour fly by? Uh, it's already 7.58. Allison turned her video on, which is a sign to me that Mark, you have gone on far uh -oh. too long with this. Here comes this. Allison. Here um, comes Allison. <laughs> and we need to now draw a conclusion uh, from all of this. Um, and I, I just kind of in conclusion, uh, before we all part our separate ways, I think something valuable that we've talked about a lot tonight, whether it was that quote from Ranger Shelton at the beginning, uh, these places do have an inherent value, I would argue, that standing and looking at the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone it does something to us, right? It's a powerful and palpable experience. But maybe when we have that meaningful experience of looking at the beauty and the grandeur of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, perhaps we consider the perspective of an indigenous person who 200 plus years ago stood in that very same spot, perhaps, mm -hmm. and who was dispossessed of that homeland. Uh, so that way you could stand in that particular spot and experience that. Um, perhaps you stand inside of old Slater Mill and you feel the rumble of the floorboards beneath your feet when we run an 1835 machine and you hear the roar of the river outside the window and you have that visceral experience in that moment and you realize that a child laborer may have experienced that very same thing. Uh, I would challenge Wallace Stegner's quote um, I would argue that the national parks reflect us at our best and sometimes at our worst. And I think that that is why the National Park Service as a whole is so critical and such an important part of our story for why we protect these places, to learn from our past and ideally to move forward to, towards a better future together. 
I want to leave you with a quote from perhaps the most well noted of the presidents when it comes to land preservation. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, he said, quote, I do not believe that any person can adequately appreciate the world of today unless he has some knowledge of a little more than a slight knowledge, but some real feeling for and of the history of the world of the past. With that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here for our first Parked at Home winter, uh, spring, winter, whatever we're kind of in here, this weird uh, moment here. I want to thank Dr. Megan Kate Nelson for joining us. I want to encourage anybody who uh, wants to hang around after and unmute uh, to join us as we continue the conversation. But if not, uh, we look forward to seeing you next week where we will welcome a, uh, a ranger from Ellis Island National Museum of Immigration. We'll talk more about the story of immigration through Ellis Island and some personal stories of individuals who immigrated through Ellis Island and came and settled here in the Blackstone River Valley. So thank you all so much. Uh, have a great night, everyone. And if you want to hang around, feel free to unmute and we can start asking some more questions.